welcome everyone. I'm Van Goss from Historians for Peace and Democracy, and my, o- my only role here is to moderate this discussion. Um, the focus is on McCarthyism, new and old, and we are very honored to have the great historian of McCarthyism, Ellen Schrecker, leading us off. Ellen is going to talk about the parallels and distinctions between the past and present, and then we will hear from Jennifer Ruth of the AUP talking about a campaign to have faculty senates pass resolutions censoring this new McCarthyism. And then Jesse Hagopian of the Zinn Educational Project will talk to us about some of their key work um, fighting back on the side of K-12 teachers. So on that note, at the end, we hope to have room for Q&A. And you can just post the Q&A to everyone in the chat and I will moderate that so that we give as many people as possible a chance. So um, Ellen, I believe it's over to you. Thanks so much, Van. And um, thank you, Cole Harrison and the Mass uh, Peace Action people for giving me this opportunity to share some of my thoughts about McCarthyism, which is something I have been studying and writing about since the early 1970s, I guess, when I first um, was teaching a small seminar in the 1950s and found myself unable to find any books about McCarthyism. And I knew it was important. I'd lived through it. My sixth grade teacher had been fired then or because of it, although I didn't know it at the time. Um, and I decided finally to uh, write the book myself. Uh, and you will notice that I do use the term McCarthyism. It is historically incorrect, I have to admit, but it's a very useful way to refer to uh, that uh, anti-communist, um, anyhow, I'm sorry, what's uh, worse today is, especially with regard to education, is that during the McCarthy period, uh, it targeted individuals. But today, the political repression is moving into the classrooms and it's forcing teachers to deny the truth about uh, racism and other uh, unpleasant uh, aspects of the American past. Um, And we're seeing it, you know, all over the place. A recent iteration occurred in Wisconsin uh, with a few weeks ago when um, they passed a law, you know, outlawing the usual stuff like uh, critical race theory, but added a a sort of list, an addenda of 88 words or phrases that uh, couldn't be used. Uh, Among them, social justice, equity, racial prejudice. Um, Now, this isn't new. American political repression has always operated with a strand of anti-intellectualism, especially uh, with regard to education. Uh, In the period before the um, Civil War, uh, it was illegal in the South to teach slaves to read. After the Civil War, uh, the Ku Klux Klan and other vigilante groups burned down the schoolhouses that the recently freed black communities had built. Uh, In the 1930s, for example, politicians and others um, passed uh, laws uh, ordering that uh, teachers take uh, oaths, uh, swearing that they would uphold the Uh, Constitution of the United States and the particular state in which they lived. Those oaths continued and intensified during the McCarthy period. It probably the most notorious was the University of California's 1949 loyalty oath that not only specifically targeted the members of the uh, university's faculty, but also contained a so-called disclaimer that added a uh, clause uh, in which the uh, teacher would have to 
uh, deny that he or she belonged to a party uh, that um, that organized, uh, that believes in or advocates or teaches the overthrow of the United States government essentially by force and violence. This was directed to, against the Communist Party, of course, but um, even after McCarthyism sort of died down, these same kind of repressive measures were being um, continued after the McCarthy period. Uh, and uh, probably one of the most notorious was the Arkansas Law Number no. 10 of 1958. Uh, that listed, that forced teachers uh, to list all the organizations that they had belonged to or given money to. And it was directly a response to President Eisenhower's uh, decision to send the National Guard to Little Rock to protect the uh, nine brave black students who had, were trying to integrate the high school there. Um, that law was overturned, but in 1960. But today, um, similar measures are, uh, of course, cropping up as well. As we begin to explore the way in which McCarthyism operated and dominated American political life in the 1950s, we've got to get rid of a bunch of myths. Uh, one of the most deleterious conflates this guy, jo Joseph McCarthy, the man, with McCarthyism, the movement. And we can see similar myths today, uh, you know, as the mainstream politicians and the media are um, focusing rather uh, horrendously on the uh, behavior of a certain Donald Trump. Um, and thus they're ignoring the forces that have spent decades pushing American politics to the right. Uh, because the process of identifying a uh, episode of political repression with a single in individual uh, really trivializes it. It treats something like um, McCarthy as an aberration and not part of a broader mainstream phenomenon. Because McCarthy, as we know, did not create McCarthyism. He was important, but he came late to his own party, which really began in the late 1940s with a set of very sensationalized congressional hearings and trials. And uh, probably more important, the Truman uh, President Truman's loyalty security program of 1947 that was largely designed by the FBI. Um, and the FBI was in fact central to McCarthyism. If any single individual could be identified with it, it wouldn't have been McCarthy, it would have been Hoover. He, uh, he and his uh, Eight allies spread scenarios that legitimized McCarthyism and uh, that created and operated the machinery that implemented it. Now, uh, compared to more brutal regimes and compared to more violent episodes earlier in American history, McCarthyism was re relatively mild. Only two people were killed. There they are, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. Several hundred went to prison and about 12 to 15,000 uh, folks lost their jobs, although there may be more because uh, we simply don't uh, know. It, a lot of this stuff was secret. But mild as it was, it was a, and um, here we have some pictures of the most famous group of uh, McCarthy victims, probably the Hollywood 10. Uh, not only did they go to prison, but they were, of course, blacklisted. Um, but mild as McCarthyism was, it was very effective in quashing dissent during the 1940s and especially 1950s. 
Uh, it functioned in accordance with a two-step procedure. The first step was that of identification. It was handled usually by a, um, a public uh, government body of some kind, uh, the FBI, a congressional committee, or else by a journalist or professional blacklister. The second stage was the application of sanctions. And this was usually done by employers, public and private, who claim, many of whom claimed they opposed McCarthyism, which they tended to identify with only that first stage of exposure. Um, but by firing the people who were identified during that first stage, uh, they created an anti-communist political test for employment. That was what made McCarthyism so successful. Now there's another myth as well that we need to deal with. And that's the notion that most of the victims of McCarthyism were quote unquote, innocent liberals. Well, most of the victims of McCarthyism were people who had some kind of connection to the broader communist movement. Um, the Communist Party had been the most dynamic group on the left during the 1930s and early 40s. As a result, because McCarthyism was specifically directed against American communism um, and was designed, in fact, to eliminate... And I'm mute is for you not to speak. Wow. But that would be for me not to speak. Um, in any event, because uh, of the focus on communism, or uh, it, when McCarthyism uh, began uh, to select its uh, targets, it reached mostly people uh, of the whole generation of left-wing political activists who had functioned within the broader penumbra of the Communist Party, even though not by no means all of them were uh, Communist Party members. Uh, now, we have to face the fact that the Communist Party had some serious flaws, uh, in particular its ties to the Soviet Union, as well as the secrecy that it um, imposed upon its own members. It was not a large party, it was not powerful, and it had been under attack ever since it was founded in the immediate aftermath of World War I. But it was the Cold War that turned the um, longtime campaign against the unpopular communist movement into the dominant element in American domestic politics uh, during the early Cold War. Its tie to the Soviet Union caused it to become a matter of national security. But, and this is crucial, McCarthyism did not spontaneously emerge once the Cold War began. It was a product of years, years of demonization um, by right-wing uh, coalitions that created and disseminated uh, wildly inflated scenarios about the dangers of American communism. Now, what made these scenarios so powerful was that they were plausible. And that's a big difference from today's culture wars, which are built, as we know, on pretty much outright lies. Um, but uh, their work was a kernel of truth within these demonized scenarios about American communism. Uh, there was espionage, definitely espionage. Um, as we know, communists had been involved during World War II when the United States and the Soviet Union were allied against Hitler, but they had given um, information to the Soviet Union. Uh, that espionage ended with the end of the war. Uh, they were also communists very active in the uh, labor movement. And this allowed uh, J. Edgar Hoover and his allies to create uh, scenarios 
um, talk that uh, portrayed communist labor leaders as um, calling political strikes uh, against defense industries or engaging in sabotage and uh, their uh, plants that they were working in. Um, that didn't happen either. Uh, and then there's the uh, trope about communists in government and the so-called loss of China. Um, this was a story that uh, claimed that a small group of foreign service officers who served in China during World War II had somehow betrayed uh, China to Mao Zedong. It supposedly explained why the United States was losing the Cold War. Um, and as if the United, which it wasn't, uh, as if the United, as, and also uh, clearly uh, China was hardly the United States is to lose. Um, sorry. Uh, yeah. I'm very, very sorry. What is going on here? Um, okay. Um, Anyhow, with, oh, within the field of education, for example, this demonization operated uh, to spread the notion that communist teachers were indoctrinating their students. Uh, that didn't happen. Uh, but by the 1950s, uh, communism had been so demonized that any kind of contact with it may, would make somebody unfit to teach or maybe take any other kind of job as well. Now, where did this demonization come from? As is happening today with that explosion of mis misinformation about and demonization of the current drive for social and political justice, um, it didn't come from the grassroots. Today's um, movement of repression is the product of a decades long campaign by a sophisticated and lavishly endowed network of right wing organizations and think tanks like the Manhattan Institute, whose staffer, uh, Christopher Ruffo, we see here, um, uh, seems to uh, be the point person for the attack on critical race theory. Now, the same thing happened during the McCarthy period. Uh, it too was a product of interconnected uh, uh, networks of anti-communist professionals, not as well-founded or funded as, or, or as sophisticated as uh, today's similar activists, but they did work together for years to create and disseminate the scenarios that provided the rationale for the uh, Cold War witch hunt. And they then managed to supply the names and information that um, fed those purges. Uh, it was a kind of motley group of individuals, uh, professional witnesses, right-wing journalists, uh, and politicians, labor leaders, the FBI, and other law enforcement agencies. And they were surprisingly self-conscious about themselves. A small group of them actually talked about themselves as Red Baiters Incorporated. And just to give you an example of the scope of these kinds of activities, I'd like to look at the career of this gentleman. His name is J.B. Matthews. He's not a household word today. But in the 1950s, he was considered the quote unquote dean of anti-communism. He had begun his career as a, minister, a Protestant minister in the 1930s, had been on the left, joined a lot of front groups uh, connected to the communist movement, and then flipped 
uh, became radically conservatives, uh, went onto the staff of HUAC during the late 1930s. And by the Cold War, this gentleman was ubiquitous. Uh, he had been collecting letterheads from left-wing organizations for years and relied upon them in his work as a widely consult consulted expert and professional witness who testified at trials and congressional hearings and immigration proceedings. He was on the, uh, had a retainer from the Right Wing Volcker Foundation. Uh, he was working with the Hearst Press and was also um, a member of a small group that was routinely consulted by Hollywood producers to pass on the political acceptability of people that they wanted to hire. In other words, he was a blacklister. Um, at the peak of uh, McCarthy's, Joseph McCarthy's notoriety, he tried to hire Matthews in 1953 as the research director for his um, newly formed uh, senatorial investigating committee. But Matthews had uh, published an article claiming that the Protestant ministers uh, in the mainstream denominations were harboring subversives. And to be quite frank, he was too, simply too radioactive even for Joseph McCarthy. But uh, Matthews continued uh, to trot his dog and pony show around the rest of the country, uh, including showing up uh, in Arkansas to testify in favor of his law number 10. And then there's the Republican Party. Just as today's wave of political repression is being fueled by partisan politics, so too was McCarthyism. Um, though there were a few right-wing Democrats who joined the anti-communist crusade, um, most of it was a Republican product. Um, the leaders of the Republican Party recognized after uh, Harry Truman's surprise victory in the 1948 election that uh, very few uh, American voters were uh, entranced by their opposition to the New Deal's reforms and that they needed to find themselves a new issue. And so they found it. They latched on to the anti-communist community's ready-made scenario that the Democratic administrations of Truman and Roosevelt had been riddled with reds. And these charges of communists in government caught on very quickly. They were plausible, they were dramatic, they were, the narratives were easy to understand, and they brought enormous publicity to ambitious politicians like this gentleman, um, Richard Nixon, whose dogged pursuit of Alger Hiss in 1948 uh, launched his political career. Uh, the loss of China became a particularly important trope for Republicans. And it was no surprise that Joe McCarthy latched onto it immediately when he began his early charges about communists and government that, last, that launched his own career. Um, the final and perhaps most important reason why McCarthyism became so powerful was that with almost no exceptions, the mainstream institutions of the United States colluded with the anti-communist crusade. From universities and public school systems to hospitals and major corporations, um, whenever their institutions uh, their employees came under attack by the witch hunters, the moderates and liberals running these institutions, who knew perfectly well that these people po were posing no threat to the United States, nonetheless fired them. They simply felt they were unable to um, avoid controversy any other way. So too, in other ways, I would argue, the Democratic Party, the Supreme Court, and the mainstream press facilitated the Red Scare by legitimizing its underlying assumptions. Um, 
At the same time, other groups that you might have assumed would have resisted the purges, like the ACLU and the American Association of University Professors, were conspicuous by their absence. Ultimately, the main opposition to the uh, Cold War Red Scare came from its victims. Their personal suffering cannot be ignored, but McCarthyism's main damage was political. It marginalized the left, it narrowed the American political spectrum, and made it impossible for certain ideas to gain a hearing or even to be expressed. The mainstream civil rights organizations, for example, uh, purged their own ranks of leftists and then abandoned all attempts to deal with economic issues. When I was teaching a class uh, before I retired uh, in uh, contemporary American history, I used to ask my students to give me their impression of the anti-war movement during the Korean War. And I always got the same answer, complete silence. And I said, yep, that's right. The criticism of the Cold War simply disappeared. Ordinary citizens feared becoming involved with anything that might be associated with the Communist Party. Um, and one former party activist that I interviewed told me that when he was a graduate student in physics at the University of Chicago, he wanted to present a petition to the department asking for the installation of a Coke machine in the lab for the students who were working on their experiments late at night. But when he circulated that petition, none of his fellow students were willing to sign. Um, people during the McCarthy period had gotten in trouble for having signed petitions in the 1930s and 40s. McCarthyism finally came to an end. It petered out by the late 50s. The witch hunt had run out of its witches. Uh, Joseph McCarthy self-destructed on national TV. And members of the establishment began to regain something of a backbone. But I think a more important reason why the Red Scare uh, folded away, uh, faded away, was the growth of the civil rights movement. As that massive social movement began to develop, it forced the rest of the nation to pay attention to the real issues that required action, not the manufactured scenarios of the anti-communist crusade. But as we're seeing today, similar campaigns can return if they're not strongly opposed. If we've learned anything from the McCarthy period, uh, uh, it's the need for collective action. We need to press that ra rational, all too gutless, moderate majority to stand up against something like the current threat to the truth. It's no time to mourn. We have to organize. And I think as our next panelist will show, there's some of that going on right now. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Van, you are muted, but I think- I know, I thought, I, I thought I'd done it. I am <laughs> unmuted. We are now turning to uh, Jennifer Ruth of the AUP who's gonna to talk to us about some practical things that those of us on campus or with friends on campus can do to oppose this vicious new campaign of intellectual repression. Yeah, and I always wanna mention that I'm actually speaking more on behalf of the AAPF Higher Education Working Group, the African American Policy Forum. I've been very active in AAUP and I remain very active. I'm on uh, AAUP's Committee A for Academic Freedom. And I'm working with AAUP on some of this, but the actual thing that I'm going to talk to you guys about today was worked out in coordination with Emily Ho, who is on this uh, on the Zoom, I think. Emily, if you want to chime in, please do. Um, so through the African American Policy Forum, which is Kimberly Crenshaw's forum and the executive director, Sumi Cho, we've been trying to figure out what kinds of collective actions can be taken. And uh, Jesse's next going to speak from the Zen Education Project is gonna to speak to a teach-in day that we're doing. Um, but the thing that we were like to do to try and 
mount some strong defense that's both simultaneous to some of this legislation and preempts some of its worst effects is to try and get collective faculty action. And one of the things that if you've read Ellen's book, No Ivory Tower, one of the things you see is that, you know, individuals can get picked off. And as she just explained, individuals get picked off and then that chills everybody, right? And, it, it, and you know, you, may, you might have an administrator who's brave here in one place and gets a little bit of media attention, uh, other administrators who throw their people under the bus and it's just sort of hodgepodge. And so it never amounts to a serious defense of academic freedom. Um, and so the, I really, I, well, and I want you to, to say again, so I can write it down. So it doesn't have to be now, but if we've learned anything from McCarthyism, it's the, the moderate gutless majority, Some, whatever that line was, I want to start using it because yeah. it's the people, the academics <laughs> who don't see themselves as doing critical race theory, who don't think that I don't have a dog in this fight necessarily. They do. We all have a dog in the fight of academic freedom and someone trying to tell us what we can teach and what our curriculum is. They come after, you know, it, there's no question in my mind that this is in McCarthyism 2.0 and academics need to do a better, faculty, everybody needs to do a better job refusing or rejecting this assault on um, academic freedom and the right to tell the truth about our history. So here's what we've got going. So if you are, you may not I know we have a, a group that was drawn for uh, because you know Ellen's work, and so I don't know how many of you are at uh, academic institutions right now. And I know Jesse next is going to speak to K through 12 a bit. So we might have some K through 12 people. We might have some higher ed people. We might have some nonprofits. We might have retired historians. Whoever we are, if you have, if you're at an institution, oh, am I sharing screen? No, I'm not, Emma. I need to share screen because I want to show you what we've got going on. If you have connections, if you know activists at academic institutions, if you yourself are, or if you're retired, you know some people who are still active, who can pursue something on their campus? What we're trying to do, and I'll start with, is this the one that I want to start with? Yes, okay, great. I'll start with this cover letter. So we've actually, this is the work we've done so far. We've sent to 50 pl uh, public flagship institutions. Some have responded and are working on it. Some we haven't heard back from. So we just need everyone who's got connections to higher ed to work your connections. So this is a letter that was sent by the critical through uh, African American Policy Forum and AAUP sent it out as well. But um, by critical race theory summer school faculty who wrote write about what why this these divisive concepts legislation anti CRT legislation what it means and why we have to demonstrate, as you see here, that faculty are organized on our own campuses to fight back. So this is the letter that we sent, we, we sent to different faculty senates. It's been, a, it's been a fairly arbitrary who it gets to, which is precisely why we need people who have roots in different institutions to follow up for us or to pursue it if we, if we didn't get to that institution. So this is a letter that we sent to people across the country and it's what we have is a, we're asking people to adapt a resolution for their faculty senate to use shared governance to say, no, we're not going to allow partisanship to interfere with what we do in the classroom um, or violate our academic freedom. So we've off, we've created a template and then we've also created we've uh, we've also given examples. That's not what I want. I'm sharing, right? Am yes. I sharing? Yes, you are sharing. <laughs> okay. um, here's an example. I'm at Portland State University, and here's an example of how my colleagues and I adapted the template A we created, the higher ed working group created, and we just brought it to the steering committee. And I will be very surprised, actually, if it doesn't pass. I expect it to pass. But we provide a little background using Ellen. McCarthyism has returned. And then we have whereas, given the background of the state legislative proposals, and then we're basically saying, um, whereas, you know, and we, we ask people to draw on statements that the institution has already made. For example, after George Floyd's murder, if they said something, if an institution made an official sort of announcement about racial justice, just sort of tie in stuff from AUP about academic freedom, tie in official statements of, of, of an institution or a Senate that previously made about racial justice. And then we say faculty senate resolutely rejects any attempts by bodies external to the faculty to restrict or dictate university curriculum. 
We say we, set, we stand with our K through 12 colleagues who might be affected by this pernicious legislation. And then we specifically suggest that people call on their actual president and provost, their administrators, to affirm that they support the faculty senate resolution. So that's what we've got going on. And we're really hoping um, it already passed. One of the other people in our higher ed working group with me and Emily is Valerie Johnson, a political scientist at DePaul. She, because we were the first to know that we were doing this, we're, we were bringing it to our senates before other people have a chance to. She's already passed hers unanimously at DePaul University. So we have one resolution that passed unanimously. We've got a number who, that are on the agendas. I'm particularly excited, and I'll try to wrap it up here, but I'm particularly excited about the fact that the chair of the Academic Freedom Committee at University of Texas, Austin, is determined to pass this resolution. And she, you know, she, as with shared governance, and that's why it's a collective act, we're trying to speak in one voice is notoriously difficult for academics, right? So we don't know, it, it won't pass everywhere. But if it passes at places like UT Austin, and if it passes at a number enough places, it sends a really strong message. And hopefully there'll also be immediate attention to these resolutions. And then we can say, we won't look back at this moment with the same regret we look back at. We won't, we won't see ourselves as the gutless moderate majority that threw, every, threw the left under the bus next time around. Um, so what I'm gonna ask you is that uh, when, after, at the end of, when, when, when our event is over, Jesse Hagopian from Zen Education Project is going to talk next. But when the event is over, the organizers are going to say thank you for coming and send you my um, email, which I'll go ahead and put in the chat. Uh, let's see. Let me make sure I'm putting it to everyone. Um, my email and remind you about this resolution. And if you have, if you're at an institution, any higher ed institution at all, um, and you think you can find some allies or find a Senate committee or some senators who will help you pass this resolution. It doesn't matter if the legislation is pending or passed in your state or not. We want everyone to send this message regardless of what state they're in. Here's my email. But if, you, if you're if you at an institution and you think you might wanna take on some of this work, we've tried to make it as easy as possible for you, please help us out and, and bring this forward at your institutions. Emily, you wanna add anything? My partner? And crime at AAPF? Nope, I'm just trying to drop links into the chat for people. Thank you. Yeah, okay, great. Emily just gave you guys the link to the page on the AAPF website that actually has the materials that I just showed you on the screen share. So between that, that link and my email, please do what you can to make this sort of movement of collective faculty action take off. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Jesse Hagopian, who's gonna tell us more about K through 12 and um, a teach-in uh, National Day of Action on October 14th. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And, and I greatly appreciate all the comments from Professor Ellen Schreiker and learned so much that is uh, gonna be so useful in arming teachers with the knowledge of how these attacks happened in the late 40s, early 50s to help us keep our colleagues safe today. Because in 11 states across the US, it is illegal to teach the truth to children about structural racism in Arizona, Florida, Georgia, Idaho, Iowa, New Hampshire, Oklahoma, South Carolina, Texas, Tennessee, and Utah, right? They want to require us to lie to kids. And to date, some 28 states have introduced this legislation uh, to try to obscure the truth about racism and sexism and other forms of oppression in the classroom. They've attacked the 1619 Project. They've attacked the Zen Education Project that I work for. Uh, the, and Black Lives Matter at School has been one of the primary targets of this right-wing attack. And in the boundless satire that is the United States of America, at the same time that Juneteenth becomes a federal holiday, right, this oldest commemoration of the ending of slavery, we have a situation where it is becoming illegal to teach about it in Texas, in the place that, uh, you know, it began and, and in places across the country. And the land of the free, I believe, 
continues to take on new and intricate shades of mockery in, in our society today. And, you know, I, I think that you really have to uh, take a look at what this attack looks like on K-12 teachers to understand the severity uh, that's going on right now. There was a teacher, Matthew Hahn from from Tennessee who was fired from his job for assigning a Ta-Nehisi Coates essay. We're talking about a New York Times best-selling author, not a, some obscure radical, right? And a poem, he assigned a poem by Kayla Janae Lacey about white privilege, right? There's a teacher in Florida, Amy Dorafono, who was fired for having a Black Lives Matter flag in her classroom. Guess why she had to have that flag in her classroom? She taught at a school called Robert E. Lee High School, named after a Confederate general, a, a genocidal maniac who went, seceded from the country in order to continue the enslavement and, and uh, genocide of black people, right? You have uh, teachers in my home state of Washington. We're talking about a blue state that doesn't have the legislature proposed. And yet we have several uh, school districts that have individually passed these types of bans on critical race theory. And as well, uh, teachers have received physical threats, right? On their uh, livelihood on their very being for uh, signing Zen Education Project's pledge to teach the truth. And these attacks are simply just proving uh, the, the tenets of critical race theory correct, which is, I think, the great irony of it, because, you know, uh, those who are pushing against um, critical race theory really confirms the central claim of critical race theory that racism is embedded in the law even when it appears to be race neutral, right? And then one of the other central claims of critical race theory is that when you have a mass pushback against racism, when there's an uprising for racial justice, there will be a backlash to that uprising, right? And the uprising of 2020 is really what spurred so many more educators across the country to begin discussions about how that could have happened to Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and Tony McDade and too many others to name, right? And now we're experiencing the backlash that is showing much of critical race theory to be more relevant than ever. And I, I wanna make this, this I wanna really emphasize this point that it's not just the worst attacks that we're seeing, that's the problem, right? It, the firing of teachers and the threats against their lives have been horrific, but far more commonplace and insidious is the chilling effect that that's having on classrooms. Because a teacher that I spoke to in Iowa, who's part of the Black Lives Matter at School movement named Monique, she explained to me that some of her white colleagues began trying to diversify their curriculum in the wake of the 2020 uprising. So one teacher uh, added Alice Walker's short story, The Flowers, to her curriculum. It's a story about a young black girl who comes across a dead body who's presumably a black man who'd been lynched. And then she thought, you know what? With this law passing in Iowa, banning the teaching of structural racism, I could lose my job teaching about this. So she put the sh book back on the shelf, right? And this is happening across America in countless other classrooms uh, and <clears throat> is part of the strategy of the radical right. And I just want to emphasize that, you know, the way that, the, that McCarthyism uh, uh, operated in the 1950s was not just to hunt out uh, communists, but I think really was wielded as a weapon against the labor movement and against movements for racial justice, right? And I think, uh, you know, the same thing is today. You have people like Christopher Rufo uh, and many politicians calling critical race theory Marxism and wielding it against movements for racial justice. So I'll just end by saying that I believe that the primary way that this billionaire class maintains its power in our society is by controlling what is acceptable knowledge and enforcing what Henry Giroux has called the violence of organized forgetting.
right? And so I think that the current attacks on critical race theory, on ethnic studies, on critical pedagogy is more than just distraction from the real economic issues, but an actual attempt at epistemicide, right? The killing or silencing or annihilation of entire systems of, of knowledge. And uh, I'll just end with the words of the great educator, Septima Clark, one of my heroes who was fired uh, for her involvement with the NAACP and her fighting for social justice and, and racial justice. And she said, I believe unconditionally in the ability of people to respond when they are told the truth. We need to be taught to study rather than to believe, to inquire rather than to affirm. So thanks everybody. I hope you will, I, I guess I should just, um, I wanna just emphasize that we have a great opportunity on Thursday, October 14th to join this movement that everybody can participate in the National Day of Action on October 14th, which is George Floyd's birthday. And we're calling on everyone to sign the pledge if you're an educator to teach the truth that we can drop in the chat. We're calling on everybody to wear shirts uh, in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter at School movement, um, wearing a black shirt or a Black Lives Matter at School shirt. Uh, and you can conduct virtual field trips of civil rights museums with young people that you're associated with. Uh, and you can support educators in your community in doing this work. So thank you. Can't hear you, Van. Doesn't look like you're muted by Zoom. Somehow your, your mic may not be picking you up. Nope. Lips moving, nothing coming out. Okay, how's this? Better, better, better. Okay, thank you. I think it's a bad uh, cable. Anyway, thank you, Ellen. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you, Jennifer. This has been extremely informative. Um, we have just a few minutes for a Q&A. Um, let's see what questions we might have. Um, Michael Hoey asked, was the lavender scare part of the red scare or a different scare? And might I add, is it related to what is happening now? Ellen, I think that's you. Was the lavender scare part of the red scare or a different scare? You would need to unmute. You're muted, oh, Alan. You're muted. Ellen. Okay. Hey, now, now, we, now we got you. All right. Uh, oh, the lavender scare. It's related. It's related. Um, you know, uh, it wasn't exactly the same thing. Um, it had... But, uh, you know, this was a period when uh, homosexuals were so deeply in the closet that yes, exposure could really damage them, just like exposure was damaging so many uh, political radicals at the same time. I mean, they did operate at the same time. And some of the leaders of the um, gay movement were in fact former communists, but the Communist Party also tried to purge its uh, gay members because uh, it was afraid of a kind of double exposure. Anyhow, um, it was uh, part of it, um, but as we say, it did not dare say its name. What can we say? Okay, let's see. Do we have other questions? Uh, Victoria Best is asking, 
if you could comment on the laws passed on several campuses in several state and some state laws criminalizing those who show support for BDS um, uh, against the government of Israel for their ongoing treatment of Palestinians. Is this related, the anti-BDS laws, do you think? I th Anyone? Th um, well, uh, I think that's very much a sort of modern form of McCarthyism, especially because it's targeting uh, a political movement of its you know, impeding their free speech. Uh, I also think that um, most, what has not sort of penetrated outside of sort of academic freedom circles is the realization that most of the victims, as it were, of um, academic uh, violations of academic freedom these days uh, have some connection to the uh, Israel issue. And it's not because they're supporting the government of Israel. Let's see, right now, I don't see any other questions. Um, hmm. So I would just add to that, that the when Ellen discussed the way in which the McCarthyism was not spontaneous, but was years in the making and was um, coordination among different groups. That's exactly what we're seeing now. We're seeing people who don't necessarily, aren't, uh, aren't, aren't focused on the Palestinian issue, but they will make common ground with Israel, you know, uh, pro-Israeli, anti-Palestinian kinds of groups in order to push their conservative issue. And we're seeing um, the, the, for example, campus reform, which is a conservative, white uh right wing white wing right wing um newspaper outlet that focuses on higher ed it's got six million dollars in funding from the coke foundation so they're all intercoordinated and they're sort of bringing their issues together and supporting one another even if they don't care about that issue um and it's very similar in that way in terms of long years in the making and a lot of funding going towards this the thing that i'm particularly concerned about is the way in which the these laws the particular laws about banning CRT, not banning 1619, not talking about divisive concepts, the way that these laws deputize students and parents and create a kind of paralegal, just like with redemption and the white citizens councils and the way in which you had these posses, these militias that were not officially police or whatever, but they were, um, they, they, they worked with police to suppress vote to voters, black voters, et cetera. We're gonna see the same kind of coordination with the campus reform and these laws and these legislators that are politically ambitious in the same way that the people in the McCarthy era were politically ambitious in using this issue. Um, and that, that really scares me. We're, we already see it on, a, on, a, on an individual by individual, but it's gonna ramp up majorly the deputizing of students and parents to go after K through 12 and higher ed faculty. Yeah, you know, think about it. People sitting in your class, uh, recording everything you do on their cell phones and mm. sending it out. Not yes. a happy prospect. And part of, part of the problem here is that there are <clears throat> campus disciplinary processes are, are, as we, many of us know, not, I'm not speaking personally here, extremely opaque. Um, uh, they are not whether they're affecting students or faculty, they are, they are in fact star chambers. And of course, I understand that under certain circumstances, this can run into a certain right wing, like fire, critique of anti-hate speech and so on. But um, I'm concerned that these, um, that these opaque processes will be, could be weaponized against because we're dealing with people who are completely cynical and opportunistic, will be weaponized against people like us. Um, that someone will, for instance, say that, you know, sp speaking out in favor of, God knows, 1619 or BDS was a personal assault, was uh, hostile, was uh, constituted harassment, all of those words, right? And, um, and then, you know, the, the same kind of, uh, you know, scared, gutless moderates that Ellen has talked about will in, react in the same way. Um, and indeed, we've seen, you know, 
Title IX claims weaponized against gay and lesbian faculty in some notorious instances. Someone, some, I mean, you know, someone who simply wanted to destroy someone's career has made charges of sexual harassment um, and uh, administrations back off. So anyway, um, uh, we will get a copy, of, there will be a copy of this recording. Um, are there any court challenges to anti-CRT laws, Victor Wallace asks? Because that would be something, I guess, right? Actually, I think Emily can speak to this. Emily, you've been following the court challenge more than I have. Emily, are you still here? Emily might not be still here. There, there is one. I, I, I haven't looked into it very closely, but there. And I'm sorry to say I haven't, so I can't explain it. But I know there's one out Emily's there brewing. Here. Oh. But she's sorry. not unmuting yet. <laughs> she can't unmute. Here I am. Oh, um, good. Sorry. So <laughs> I I think there are court challenges or a court challenge forthcoming, um, but I am not, I don't know much more than that. And I'm not at liberty to say much more than that. So, but just keep, keep stay tuned. I think probably it's coming. Okay. So I'm putting into the chat a link to Historians for Peace and Democracy, which did organize this webinar, because if you are in any way connected to, you know, higher ed, or just an activist scholar of any sort, feel free to join us. There's no large major dues payment. Um, we just are um, looking for looking for people who want to do some some activist work on campus, around campus, off campus, using history as a tool in a fight against the white nationalist authoritarian right which is in fact right now the central mission of Historians for Peace and Democracy or HPAD as we call it. Um, so look in the chat and you can see, w oh, it should be www, I think everyone got that mistake, historiansforpeace.org. And we welcome members and we are gearing up for this fight with, I wanna point say, she won't say it, Ellen Schrecker in leadership and she's the right person to be doing it. No, no, you are. So I think we're but at 804. Like and Winkle in the face of No, no, no. You, you've, got, you've got the expertise and we have other, we have tremendous allies here in the AAAPF and in the Zen Education Project and hopefully in AAUP. Um, so thank you, Jennifer. And thank you, Jesse. This was really great. I got a lot out of it. And we will sign off now. And thanks everyone for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.